This is Fort Carson now. Fort Carson, Colorado, home to the U.S. Army's 4th Infantry Division. The fundamental essence of what we do when we're not deployed is to train. And that's one of the primary responsibilities of the U.S. Army Garrison here at Fort Carson, is to provide the best training venue, the best training resources. You send someone off to war unprepared, that's almost, that's criminal. Yesterday, it was kind of like a last minute thing that we were told, hey, we're going to get to use Blackhawks today. So it's my first real experience actually being able to use a Blackhawk. The training we do here at Fort Carson is very important because it's what prepares soldiers to do their mission in theater and brings them home safe. Effectiveness springs from readiness. Readiness comes from practice and training. At the Mountain Post, training prepares soldiers to defend and protect America on this edition of Fort Carson Now. Military effectiveness develops from the practice of learned skills and the acquisition of new ones. Warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan has required the new skills of COIN, or counterinsurgency combat. As the United States ends its military presence in the Middle East, the Army returns its attention to the more traditional combat elements of armor and artillery. The 4th Infantry Division, headquartered at Fort Carson, Colorado, relies on training to make the transition. It's important to always stay current on, on what you're doing um, and always stay current on what's going on in a the theater that you may deploy on. And, and to do that, you're going to have to constantly train to get better. But the issue has become now is that, that counterinsurgency focus that we've all shifted to from mid, the mid-2000s to where we are today where now we're getting back to full spectrum, which is attack, defense, stability, and support operations, and defense support to civil authorities, this kind is called. So that's how you deal with wildfires and floods and things like Katrina and those types of things. So that's what we're getting everybody back to. So call for fire, obstacles, breaching big obstacles, but tanks and close air support and close attack aviation, all those things have, you know, in pieces, parts have worked in Iraq and Afghanistan for targeting, but not the same as a force on force full movement to contact, you know, multi-theater war type approach to how we train. My deployments uh, have been limited to Iraq, uh, but from what, I, what I've seen, what I've gathered out here, the, uh, the training environment, as well as the training that we're doing specifically, it, it's, it mirrors the rigors uh, that you can expect to see overseas uh, in today's battlefield. We did a lot of train up, not only before, but also certainly after the deployment. It's a constant uh, train, deploy, train, deploy. Uh, we saw a lot, of the, a lot of the training mirrors what we do over there. It's not something we do, it's what we do. Without confidence, you can't train. But without training, you can't gain confidence. So that's why we start at the section, at the individual and section level. So that guy doesn't have to be in front of his platoon sergeant or be in front of his platoon leader or his troop commander or company commander and feel like everyone's judging him and waiting for him to make a mistake. So you can make all those mistakes and pivot steering the wrong way and throwing track and not remembering your gun sight line and, and fratricide and, and understanding where it is that all your weapon systems go. Uh, and that's why we've dedicated so much time to the individual and to the sections uh, so they can work through a lot of those procedures. And so when we ask them to go to the platoon maneuver and troop maneuver, they fit right in. The fact is they are the best trained army in the history of mankind. If you look at the operational readiness and the, his, and the lessons learned over the last 10 years that we fought in combat operations overseas, uh, it comes through time and time again to leaders and commanders at all levels the importance of training. The fundamental essence of what we do when we're not deployed is to train. And that's one of the primary responsibilities of the U.S. Army Garrison here at Fort Carson is to provide the best training venue, the best training resources to allow leaders and commanders at all levels to train their soldiers, maintain their readiness in preparation for their wartime missions uh, overseas. There's four brigades training on one installation and in this installation that causes a lot of conflict and uh, to be able to synchronize um, so that all units can do the training that they need to do to deploy or conduct their mission is, is kind of a daunting task. Obviously the most important thing is we have the best trained 
lead soldiers, which we do, then the question becomes, how do you equip them? There's lots of different type of training that goes on to, to prepare for the big picture, other than going down range. Some of those things are conducting squad level or individual level task training here in the motor pool or on main post somewhere, even in the classroom. Um, and then transitioning from that to conducting digital training at a lot of the digital facilities using simulations in an indoor environment. And then that's often transitioned to using simulations um, in an outdoor environment before they go down range to conduct full spectrum training in an environment where they're shooting big tank rounds. We are the training support center for the installation. So anything that the soldiers are doing to train, we can support their training, um, either in-house or if we have to go out to other installation to get the assets that the soldiers need to help support or facilitate their training, we can do just that. Uh, if, if it's with equipment, personnel, or any other asset, we can go out and get that for them to support their training. Got him. Reload. One of our branches are aviation, so we have aviation simulations, we have medical simulations, and here we have all the ground tads and medical tads here in the facilities that help support them. We have everything from um, Humvee rollover trainers, MRAP rollover trainers, driver simulators, and then all your common everyday training aids here within the facility. Improvement occurs because, along with practice, soldiers receive feedback about their performance. The cycle of practice and feedback provides the foundation of a soldier's readiness. It's hard, unless you've been there, to explain that that evaluation process for another unit is probably the most important training that they get because it's somebody else telling them from an outside source that whether they need to work on something or that they're good. And if, they, if you get that from somebody who has no qualms and has no tie to any of the unit, uh, it really helps them out. Fort Carson provides a wide array of training resources where soldiers can overcome the additional challenges of recovering unused skills as Fort Carson Now continues. This is Fort Carson Now. Mine was earned off Vietnam in 1968 over the South Pacific in 1943. I got mine in Iraq 2003. USAA Auto Insurance is often handed down from generation to generation because it offers a superior level of protection and because USAA's commitment to serve the military, veterans, and their families is without equal. Begin your legacy. Get an auto insurance quote. USAA, we know what it means to serve. As the 4th Infantry Division makes the transition from combat tactics focused on counterinsurgency or COIN and urban warfare to a focus on the other tactics in the broader spectrum of combat, new training challenges arise, recovering dormant skills. We still need a lot of training. Training is something that will go downhill if you don't use it. I'm currently in an S3 office, so I don't actually get as much training sometimes as some of the line companies. Basic soldiering skills uh, built at the lowest levels of private, and that, that needs to have good NCOs who uh, teach them each of the Army values, um, put in the training, because um, when you do that, you have a universal soldier uh, across the board who knows how to pick up a weapon, how to shoot it um, effectively. Um, how to maneuver, how to use a radio, and, and that falls on NCOs. We really started at the section level, so two vehicles working through what their crew duties and responsibilities were, uh, and so we started that in January. Uh, February we had a Scout X where we ramped it up where they were maneuvering now, and then we did a Troop X where we got the platoons to start maneuvering. It's the very core of of the tanking, more than just the, the gunnery aspect of, of shooting a tank, it's also the maneuver part that's most important, how to maneuver around enemies and how to uh, take on the enemy when they come at you as far as doing the contacts. So when they attack you, you know how to maneuver the whole tank to in the section to uh, eliminate the enemy as quickly as possible and continue on the mission. And then we began uh, with our decisive action lanes, 
uh, getting into platoons and then doing troop maneuver for two weeks just to get ready for the bigger troop, uh, the last ex-eval period, so the external evaluation uh, where a guy like myself looks at other troop and company commanders across the brigade and says, hey, we probably need to work on this or we don't. To watch those guys actually communicate on the radio, going from uh, a bunch of nonsense on a radio to being able to maneuver you know, eight, eight vehicles in a platoon um, has been very rewarding because you can, you can hear them using their maps, using their, their FBCB2s, uh, all the systems that are part of that to, to get where they can actually maneuver a troop now. So now when we go to the National Training Center, we can get to the squadron, battalions, and the brigade uh, moving throughout. Fort Carson is unique in the training areas that they have because um, main post or Fort Carson proper training areas are a little bit um, constricted at times, especially for the number of troops we have here. So to conduct some large maneuver training, we have the ability to go to Pena Canyon or other installations. All that is conducted on their main installation. In a simulator, you have a little bit more controlled environment, so you can sit down more one-on-one -on -one with the soldier. Uh, plus, it gives you different uh, feedback measures. You get different AER fu functions of it, so you can actually sit down as the soldier's firing. You can watch them as they're firing and watch them on the screen, where their aim point is, whether they're pulling the trigger, jerking the trigger, different things that they can do wrong uh, in operating of a weapon. So now you can sit down in real time, see what it is each individual's uh, having issues with, then you can narrow it down, figure out what soldiers having what issues. Then you're able to actually have a playback and actually put it back up on the screen so the soldier can actually see where they were aiming, how they were uh, uh, looking at the target, whether they were jerking the trigger. Most of them walk out with a lot more confidence. And that's a big thing with a weapon. Um, soldier that has confidence in his weapon, you know, he's gonna function with that weapon that much more effectively. Besides simulations, getting out in the field gives the soldiers the feel of actual deployment. We woke up at about 3 this morning, 3, 3.15, had this process called Stand 2 where we put on all our body armor and everything and then uh, defended our assembly area against potential threats. And then from there we mounted up into the Bradleys and then we started our mission today, which was a deliberate attack and movement to a village, uh, which we were supposed to suppress a riot. You're gonna to get to six and then eight and come back. Roger. So I'm gonna to try to get the more southwest we can get without being seen and have a element. Sand table is your uh, overlay of uh, the area that we're gonna be going through. Um, that way we know the uh, key train features, um, what possible uh, obstacles we're gonna be coming, coming to as far as natural terrain, uh, mountains, saddles, um, which trails we need to take, um, where likely the enemy supposed to, could possibly be, their, their best. Uh, eyes on us as far as they try to attack us where we would think they would be. And then um, we sit down with the whole platoon and figure out where everyone's going to go and how we're going to maneuver. Um, throw in the, uh, the what ifs if we had attacked from this position here and here. Who's going to move around the enemy and who's going to cover each other. It's actually been fun because I get to design things from ground and see it all the way through to fruition. Because it started with just a concept and something on a, on a calendar, and to get everybody out there, 575 troopers, uh, in one location with all the, the fuel, food, uh, porta johns, everything that, that comes together to, to exercise that kind of system, uh, it takes a lot of work. Training at the Mountain Post for the full spectrum of combat operations necessary for the future, when Fort Carson now returns.
Counterinsurgency combat and urban warfare, like that in Iraq and Afghanistan, requires boots on the streets, not armor in the field. After 10 years of carrying out dismounted operations, at Fort Carson, the 4th Infantry Division mounts up. It has been fun to go back to less of being on the ground and more involved in our vehicles and doing long range shots because our vehicles are designed to, to kill it at you know, 2,500, 3,000 meters and farther. And so we've really been focused on a, on a close fight. And so to get the guys back into that mindset, get into full gunnery and get into the mindset of movement and maneuver. We don't stick to roads, we get out on open fields. We maneuver to, to close with and destroy the enemy. It has been a near complete mind shift from the guys over the last uh, 10 to 15 years that we've been really working through each of these. And I've been fortunate enough to see and be part of the Army that did nothing but maneuver and long range shots and then the, the interim period of 10 years to, to work on counterinsurgency and now getting back to doing both. Um, less on counterinsurgency and more on, on the high intensity stuff, uh, which is more fun. Uh, because you get to pair both of those skills together. Look up! Right, up! It's very important for, for us to be able to train um, like we would fight in a real world situation and that would require us to train at dark hours and nighttime hours or limited visibility type training and, and to do that we're going to have to do that in the evening or early in the morning um, so that we're better prepared to do our mission if we're called upon. We're basically training up in, for a more armored uh, conventional fight as opposed to uh, what we've been doing in, uh, in terms of a coin fight that we've been doing the last 10 years or so. So we're just getting retrained up on that. It's been a few years since uh, the unit's been through training like this. We're uh, doing zone reconnaissance, uh, movement to contact. We're also setting up uh, screen lines, providing security. Um, basically, we're all running it. Uh, this is the first time we've run troop level missions. So my platoon's fitting into the troop and we're functioning at the troop level. And then we're kind of building it into the squadron supporting uh, the entire brigade. Uh, so we're basically building up uh, onto each higher level. Up till now, it's basically just been my platoon out uh, maneuvering and conducting missions. So putting that all together is really a big step uh, forward and it gets a lot more complex. I am real world medical coverage, you know, if anything does actually happen, I'm the one to treat it and take care of it. I also have the training um, aspect of it, you know, we do take casualties from time to time and I'm evaluated on how I assess my patient and, you know, treat the casualty. And, you know, I'm also a safety officer and make sure that everybody's, you know, cleaning properly, taking care of their, their body right. Well, this is our third day. Uh, the entire field problem is going to run uh, close to a month. All of this is uh, essentially just building up to what's going to become a, uh, a company stick lane where it's going to be built into a force on force. Two companies are going to, uh, well one company will defend against the other and one company will attack and uh, all three platoons along with the headquarters elements from, from each company are going to be uh, tasked with uh, engaging and destroying the uh, element that's uh, trying to take their ground. We've been out here for roughly 20 something days ish and the first like four or five days was kind of like uh, platoon uh, versions of the same stuff. Um, just every like four or five days we've been moving on from platoon to company, then battalion, then brigade, and now we're on the brigade section of it. And it's just basically been running through the same style of lanes, um, getting more practice for this kind of stuff. So yesterday, like it was kind of like a last minute thing that we were told, hey, we're gonna get to use Blackhawks today. And that was just it. So it's my first real experience actually being able to use a Blackhawk. The biggest thing about the whole Blackhawk situation is the rotor wash and properly loading and movement to the bird and from the bird. So having someone actually there and having an, a working Blackhawk there
gives me a lot of training experience just in the fact that I know how to move to it, I know what to expect, and it just makes things easier in the future. I would have to say I like this the most so far because I've had the most opportunities to deal with real world and notional casualties and plus the ability to use the Blackhawks that, that helped a lot too so I, I think this has been my best training so far. Preparing today for the battlefield of tomorrow. Some costs and benefits as Fort Carson now continues. This is Fort Carson now. Preparing and training for combat operations requires days, sometimes weeks away from family and home, living in a simulated combat environment. Every boom that you hear is probably another two or three lives saved inside of the Army and in the military as a whole because they, that guy has gained so much confidence in that weapon system now. He knows how to effectively employ it. So every day uh, of good training that's not wasted um, is training that saves lives uh, saves probably millions of dollars in taxpayers' dollars too because now you're not frivolously slinging rounds down range that, that make no sense whatsoever, um, but you are now being good stewards of taxpayers' money, good stewards of time for the individuals um, that mothers and fathers have trusted their sons and daughters to us with uh, to ensure that they're the most highly proficient group of people that we can get them and turn them from people into troopers and into soldiers. Pretty much every skill we learn in basic training is a perishable skill. They call it basic so you can get an idea of what it is is expected of you in a combat environment. If you don't keep yourself up on those skills, they become rusty and when you get put into a combat environment, you could be putting yourself and your unit at risk because you no longer have those skills or you don't have the skills as good as they were when you first got through them. So if you don't train regularly like with weapons and all that, you become rusty. And when you actually get there in the situation where it's actually life and death, you might have some issues. We do physical training on a daily basis in order to keep our stamina up to meet the rigors of war. When we're actually in a hot zone, we carry our individual equipment as well as a lot of ammunition and some other gear that we have. As a medic, I also carry my aid bag, which at times can weigh up to 50 pounds. We were in a deployment situation a couple years back where I had to run from my vehicle approximately 300 meters to another vehicle in order to assist with the casualty that we had taken. And while we were doing that, we were getting shot at. But because we do physical training on a regular basis, I didn't get tired during the entire run that I sprinted over to his vehicle. Every time we do training and every time a helicopter flies over, sometimes it's disturbing, uh, but it's, it is something that has to be done or we, we lose lives initially. Uh, and I, I don't want to go through that again. I've already been through that too many times uh, over the last 14 years. Uh, it's important uh, to actually continue training. Uh, the, the sweat that we shed now is blood that we save later. You've got to love what you do. You know, I did it for 25 years. I love training soldiers. I'm back to training soldiers. You know, it, it's what I've done forever, and I still think I have something left to give. It, it's a joy, but yet it's a challenge, you know, because we know um, the experience um, firsthand, um, we have done deployments, you know, our staff, but we know what they're about to head into. So we sit down and we work with them on the things that they're going to do and we just give them advice.
I had great leadership um, and it, I just really trusted him and he of course he told me the situations he's been in you know and knowing that he could handle that was huge for me because I was like okay this guy knows what he's doing and everything he teaches me is going to be gold you know that's what I got to use and and when things really did happen that's that's the first person I thought about you know he was teaching me step by step what I had to do and that's exactly what I did and it is huge you are going to pay attention a little bit more to the person that's been there and done that than the guy that you know that hasn't really been there you know he just has the training so but um, yes, leadership, mentoring, it's, it's huge in the Army, I do believe that. At the Mountain Post, drilling and practicing, long hours away from life's comforts, demanding attentiveness despite limited rest, small squads and platoons functioning in a coordinated manner to form a full fighting force, each individual trusting that the other will execute within the range of his or her training each individual confirming dependability by consistently performing to standards. All this to defend our nation decisively. Based on the information we get back, most of the time the units are very prepared for the mission that they do. They take this training very seriously when they're back here at Fort Carson, and that's why they train so hard and prepare so hard so that when they go into theater, they're prepared to conduct whatever mission the country asks of them. Training in the full spectrum of combat operations. Training to maintain vigilance and readiness. We always fight the same way, so it's to close with and destroy the enemy. So regardless if it's, you know, full spectrum operations or if it's counterinsurgency, we always train to, to fight and win. Training for noble and patriotic purpose. I feel confident in my ability to get the job done. This has been Fort Carson Now. Thanks for watching. This is Fort Carson now. 